Kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for then is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we're going to do the litanies of the third hour. Your Holy Spirit, O Lord, whom you sent forth upon your holy disciples and honored apostles in the third hour, do not take away from us, O good one, but renew him within us. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. O Lord, who sent down your Holy Spirit upon your holy disciples and your honored apostles in the third hour, do not take him away from us, O good one, but we ask you to renew him within us. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, the Word, our right and life-giving spirit, a spirit of prophecy and chastity, a spirit of holiness, righteousness, and authority. O the Almighty One, for you are the light of our souls. O you who give light to every man that comes into the world, have mercy on us. Together. O Theotokos, you are the true vine who bore the cluster of life. We ask you, O full of grace with the apostles, for the salvation of our souls. Blessed is the Lord our God. Blessed is the Lord day by day. He prepares our way, for he is the God of our salvation. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who is present in all places and fills all, the treasury of good things and the life giver. Graciously come and dwell in us and purify us from all defilement, O good one, and save our souls. Just as you were with your disciples, O Savior, and gave them peace, graciously come also and be with us and grant us your peace and save us and deliver our souls. Whenever we stand in your holy sanctuary, we are considered standing in heaven. O Theotokos, you are the gate of heaven. Open for us the gate of mercy. O Lamb of God, who carries the sins of the world, hear us, and we, your children, say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so we don't have to be very formal. We don't have to, we'll just read some stuff in the Bible. Can you hear okay? Okay, all right. Don't need the microphone? Okay. Huh? Why? Where? There's a Sunday school in the church. In the parking lot. Just open market preaching? Yeah, I'm going to skip that today. <laughs> I'll leave that for Peter. Um, so Peter left and a group of people went to Kenya yesterday. So we need to pray for them that God will use them. I'm actually going this week, so I'll, I'll uh, join them soon. So uh, this is the fast. What do we call this fast? The Apostles Fast. No one likes the Apostles Fast. And I think it's because we're using the wrong name. We're, you know, we don't fast to the Apostles. We always fast to... We fast to God. And so that's something that I feel like, oh, this is the apostles. I mean, Lent, okay, we're fasting because Jesus Christ fasted, and everyone loves St. Mary, so we fast for St. Mary. But we don't fast to St. Mary. We fast to God. And for me, we're not fasting for the apostles. Yeah, you guys, you guys are getting an extra blessing for you. You're giving up the shrimp tacos for the, the Word of God. May you be filled more than them. And so... It's actually the fast of the work of the Holy Spirit in the apostles. The work of the Holy Spirit is the most important thing 
in our lives. You know that the Bible says we can't do anything without the Holy Spirit? If you look at 1 Corinthians 12, it says we cannot say Jesus Christ is Lord truly without the Holy Spirit. That's the most basic thing. To not be able to say Jesus Christ is Lord in truth with faith, that's the most basic thing. And we know that our understanding of the Bible and Abuna mentioned in the sermon that people have all kinds of different, and maybe we're not all being led by the Holy Spirit into the true understanding of the Word of God. We don't receive grace through the sacraments without the Holy Spirit. What brings the presence of Christ into the bread and wine? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the, you know, in the baptism, what makes the water, water is a regeneration. It's the Holy Spirit. Same thing with the oil. And so, I feel like we don't talk about the Holy Spirit enough, and it saddens me if we can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you, we have the Holy Spirit, and what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. So if the Holy Spirit sanctifies us, why are we not saints? The Holy Spirit makes us holy. How come we're not holy? Are we all saints? Okay, I, can't, I can't speak for myself, maybe you are, and I just haven't discovered it yet, but is it a problem in the Holy Spirit that we're not saints? The problem is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God. So if the problem is not the Holy Spirit, then it must be in us. You know what the Holy Spirit does? You know what the word Messiah means? Like in Arabic, it's a little bit more clear. Messiah, at Masah. He was anoint, the anointed one. So, the Holy Spirit anointed Christ, the Holy Spirit, we were anointed by the Holy Spirit, so we are also little messiahs or little Christs. We are supposed to be, in the, and the fathers say, the Holy Spirit makes us little Christs. And so that's an amazing thing. Do you believe that's possible? If you understand what the Holy Spirit does, if you have your Bibles, I'm a Bible flipper. We're going to just use our Bibles, and uh, let's, let's just... 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians, it's funny, they put it right after 1 Corinthians. It's pretty convenient, I guess. So, you guys got it? It says this, We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. By what? By the Spirit of the Lord. We're being transformed into the image of God from glory to glory by the Holy Spirit. It's a process. So let's go to 1 Corinthians. How much does the Holy Spirit work in us? What can the Holy Spirit do for us? I want you to look in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. So St. Paul is saying, Who knows the things of a man but the Spirit of man? Who knows the things of God but the Spirit of God? And if you look at the very last verse in chapter 2, I love this verse. He says in verse 16, Who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. How do we have the mind of Christ? He says, Who knows the mind of God except the Spirit of God? So how could we have the mind of Christ or the mind of God? It's the Spirit of God that gives us the mind of Christ. So we can be transformed into His image by the Holy Spirit. We can have the mind of Christ by the Holy Spirit. We are anointed, we are little messiahs, little anointed ones, just like Christ was by the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to transform us to be like Christ, but it also reveals to us who Jesus Christ is. And the Holy Spirit, even Christ said this about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit doesn't talk about itself. The Holy Spirit is what draws us closer to Christ and allows us to understand Christ. We are adopted to Christ through the Holy Spirit. We become sons. Where we cry out, Abba, Father, it's all by the Holy Spirit. So, again, why are we not more like Christ? Why are we not all saints? Is it the Holy Spirit's fault? It can't be. Is the Holy Spirit weak? I'm going to go to Romans real quick. Let me see if I have... I don't have that. So in Romans chapter 8, it says something pretty amazing about the Holy Spirit. It says, he says, if the Spirit...
spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So how did Jesus rise from the dead? By the Holy Spirit. Probably the greatest act in the history of mankind. If Satan wanted to hold one person down there, it was Jesus. But the Spirit raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And if he dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Wait, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same one that dwells in you. So it's not because the Holy Spirit is weak. The Bible tells us that God who is in us is greater than he that is in the world. If the Holy Spirit was given to you for the purpose of making you holy and is inside of you and the Holy Spirit is not weak, how come we're not saints? Well, let's look at some things that the Bible teaches us. In Galatians, so those of you who are just joining, uh, have your Bibles ready. We're going to be looking through verses in the Bible. But this is one of the problems why the Holy Spirit is not working on us. He says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So either we're following the flesh or we're following the spirit. Let's look at this verse in Romans chapter 8. It's very clear. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. To be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The carnal mind is enmity against God because it's not subject to the law of God, nor can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You notice there's a dichotomy, not just a dichotomy that there's a flesh and the spirit, there's actually a war. It's going on inside of us. It's flesh versus spirit. And the flesh is opposing the Spirit of God working in you. And I want to ask you, is there anyone who will deny this? There's, tr- there's times where we're trying to co- control our flesh even more, like in the fasts, and we pay more attention to spiritual things. We feel like we're growing when we're fasting, when we're controlling the flesh. But when we aren't fasting... Like in the Holy 50 Days, you gained all this great depth and spiritual understanding during Lent. Then you stop fasting, then what happens? You don't control your flesh. Everything of the Spirit gets lost. It's very clear that when we're controlling our flesh, we can grow. And the Spirit works in us. And so I like to call this the fast of the Holy Spirit because if we're fasting We're controlling our flesh and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us. For those of us who are choosing, we don't want to fast. Who's guiding you not to fast? Is that the Holy Spirit or the flesh guiding you not to fast? It all depends who are we listening to. And this is the reality for me and maybe for you. But most of my spiritual weaknesses, most of my downfalls, the things that I'm most ashamed of in my spiritual life, They come from my flesh. When I'm not controlling my flesh, I find myself furthest from God. So let's look at the works of the flesh. St. Paul says in Galatians 5, The works of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. Okay, many of you, unless you're Harry Potter fans, are not doing sorcery, but hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, Selfish ambitions, dissensions, those are things maybe we are more prone to doing. And these are the works of the flesh. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, as I told you in time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you look in the same uh, book in Galatians, in chapter 3, okay, he mentions something, sorry, in chapter 5. It's right after he talks about that flesh part. He says this. This is his advice. And those who are Christ's, meaning if you belong to Christ, for the Spirit to work in you, he says, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. 
He says, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. As if they're two absolutely different things. Either we are crucifying the flesh and all its passions, or we're living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, as we said, which leads to life and peace and joy. The Bible is very clear about this. And so if we're not growing, if this fast isn't very beneficial for us, maybe it's because we're allowing the flesh to take control and not the Spirit. It says this in In Romans 8. By the way, if you want to read about the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8 is amazing. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts, and Galatians talks about the flesh versus the Spirit. In Romans 8 it says, If you live according to the flesh, you will... You will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. When we were talking about crucifying the flesh, then the last verse, you're like, how am I going to crucify the flesh? I can't do it. What does he tell us here? If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He doesn't say do it by yourself. But by the Spirit of God working in you, we can put to death the deeds of the body. So oftentimes it's just a choice. It's a choice that we make. We're choosing to allow the flesh to be in charge or the spirit to be in charge. Look at this verse in Romans 8. He says, Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on... Sorry, wrong verse. He says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, you are that one slaves whom you obey? So it's a choice. Who are you presenting yourself to? Are you presenting yourself for the flesh to take control, or are you presenting yourself, he says, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? He says, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God. So we actually have a choice. Who are we presenting ourselves to? Who are we allowing to be ruler over us? He says, you are that person's slave whom you obey. Many of us find that we are slaves to our flesh because we're allowing our flesh to rule. And we find that we're not growing in God because we're not presenting ourselves to be servants of God. And so that actually is our choice. We may not have the Spirit working in us because we're choosing not to work with the Holy Spirit. That's your choice. So let's talk about some of the warnings in the Bible that are sins against the Holy Spirit, and we have to pay attention to these because some of them are detrimental to our spiritual life. So some of the sins against the Holy Spirit, you can grieve the Holy Spirit, you can quench the Spirit, you can resist the Spirit, and you can blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Let's start with the lighter ones, like grieving the Holy Spirit. Well, how do we grieve God? In general, we grieve God when we fall into sin. And the Holy Spirit is grieved because He dwells in us. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. And in Ephesians 4.30 it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve Him by sinning. It says, God in His love, when we fall, He tries to restore us. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. So when we are grieving the Holy Spirit by sinning, the Holy Spirit tries to convict us of sin. So what is the Holy Spirit trying to do to get us to repent? So the first thing we can grieve the Holy Spirit, we probably all fall into sin occasionally. Maybe some more often than others. But we all grieve. He says, do your best not to sin. Okay, let's talk about quenching the Spirit. In uh, verse Thess- Thessalonians 5.19, it says, Do not quench the Spirit. Well, what does that mean, to quench the Spirit? Do you guys know what it means to quench a fire? What does it mean to quench a fire? You pretty much put it out. Either you cover it with dirt or with water, and you take away its effect. So the first part is falling into sin, fine. But then the Holy Spirit convicts you, trying to bring you back. But then we quench the Spirit by not allowing the Spirit to talk. And so this is important for us because a lot of time in our spiritual lives we say, I don't want to read the Bible today. I don't want to pray today. I actually don't want to go to liturgy today. And all of a sudden we're quenching. The Spirit is trying to convict you of the sins to bring you back. But we're saying, I just don't want to anymore. 
Now you're just quieting the voice of the Spirit within you. That's a dangerous step. That's a dangerous step because then the next thing is resisting the Spirit. And if anyone rejects the work of the Spirit, you resist. So now it's like you know that that's a sin, but you know what? I, I, stop talking to me, God. I want to do it anyway. You see how first we, we all sin out of weakness. Okay, that's grieving the Holy Spirit because we sin. But then the Holy Spirit is trying to convict you through the Word of God, through sermons, through the liturgy, through just prayer. But then we're quenching His voice. Then all of a sudden, you hear the voice, but now you're blocking Him out. You're saying, I don't want to do those things. I want to do the things that I want to do. I don't want to obey the Spirit. I want to obey the, I want to obey the flesh. I want to obey me. I want to do what I want. All of a sudden, now you're resisting the Holy Spirit. Now, the last verse, which actually was read today in the Gospel, I need you guys to pay attention to. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is in Matthew 12. Christ said there are sins that will be forgiven. If you were to talk about the Son of God, that would be forgiven. But if you were to talk about the Holy Spirit, it would not be forgiven you. Wait a minute. The one sin that will not be forgiven is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. The one sin that will not be forgiven is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's when you are completely rejecting the work of God in you. It's almost like you're dead to the Holy Spirit and you don't want to have anything to do. And that's when people like just block God out of their life completely. Now, I realize none of you here are at that level where you've completely rejected God. I mean, you didn't come here just for the tacos because you didn't know it was here until you came. So I, I believe you're here for another reason. But it's important for us to recognize the path that leads us away from God. And when I ask you, where are you in this progression? Are you at the grieving part where, okay, we sin, but we're still listening? Or are you at the quenching part where I'm no longer trying to hear? Or at the next part where I do hear, but I'm rejecting? None of you are at the blasphemy part. But where are you? Because you see there's a progression. It's better to see where you are before you go one step further and remedy that. We have to remedy that. So I want you to realize if there are sins that are taking us away from God against the Holy Spirit, then do you think that maybe there's a similar progression towards getting closer to the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. There absolutely is. So when people are baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit. We're baptized and you receive the Holy Chrism. You get anointed with the oil. You receive the Holy Spirit in that uh, sacrament, and so you become a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is now dwelling inside of you. So the first step in order to have the Spirit work in you is to have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Everyone here has received the Holy Spirit, so that's the very first part. And there's a verse in John chapter 3 that Christ says, God does not give the Spirit by measure. It's not like you got a drop of the Holy Spirit. You got the Holy Spirit. So all the power and the abilities and the gifts and the graces of the Holy Spirit are available to you. So the first part is receiving the Holy Spirit. You have the full potential of the Holy Spirit's work in you. But there's actually more than just receiving at the initial time of your sacrament. In Acts, so many times it says, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had already received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, but then they were filled again and again. Uh, let me see if I have it here. It says in Acts 4, it says, When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What did they do in order to fill, be filled with the Holy Spirit? What were they doing? They gathered together and prayed with one mind, and then they were filled and the place was shaken. And in Acts 13, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. They had already received, but that means that there is an opportunity to be filled again. How are we filled again and again? It's by the grace that we receive in the sacraments. Where can you receive more grace than in communion? This is the body and blood of God himself in you. Is there something greater that you could do where you could receive more grace than that? I really don't know. But 
The thing is we need to constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you want to be led by the Spirit, you have to be filled. So it's in when I said Acts 13:52, when they were filled, this was Barnabas, um, and then Stephen was described as being full of the Holy Spirit. They reached the capacity of the Holy Spirit working in them. They did amazing signs. They did amazing wonders. So I have a question. Is that Holy Spirit still alive today in the church? Are there still prophecies? Are there still teachings? Are there still healings? Are there still miracles? Are there still signs and wonders? Maybe not much. Why? It is It is available and it is happening. It is present. But why is it not happening as often? It's because of our lack of faith. It's our lack of faith. I was just reading about this uh, this morning. But the same Holy Spirit can do all these things available to us, but because of our lack of faith, we're not doing these things. And granted, there are gifts. Not everyone wants to just start walking around their shadow will start raising people from the dead. But there are gifts given to each person according to the needs of the church, and the gifts are given for the benefit of all. Okay, so we talked about receiving the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, then I want to say this. It's important for us. Again, this is in uh, Galatians. It says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see how there's, again, they're opposite. You can walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So he says, walk in the Spirit and then be led by the Spirit. It's extremely important that you understand that if you're not walking, what does walking in the Spirit mean? It's actually your daily life. Are you, like in the morning, are you trying to please God? Are you trying to perform? If you look at Ephesians chapter 5, it says, walk in love, walk in wisdom, walk in peace, where it's all of a sudden like, you are walking in the commands of God. So in the morning, are you trying to satisfy your desires, your dreams, your will? Or in the morning, you say, I want to walk in the Spirit. So you've all received. We were filled. Now are you walking with? Then the next part after walking is something amazing. It's when you are being led by the Spirit. This is like something that I think we all desire to be. We, we're all confused. We don't know how to act. We don't know what decisions to make. But when you are led by the Spirit, that is the highest level. There's a, there's a song, a line in a song, which I heard. I, I love this line. It's one of my favorite lines in any song. is, lead me to the place where my faith is without borders. Where like you are being led by the Spirit of God, where you don't worry. Wherever you take me, I will follow. In order to be led, that means you have to be willing to follow. And oftentimes the Spirit will lead you to do things that are difficult, challenging. It might require boldness. But then all of a sudden when you completely trust, what happens? God is going before you. He's going around you. He's parting the, the waves for you. And all of a sudden you're like, okay, God, this is amazing. To be led by God. To be led by the Spirit is one of the greatest things you could ever accomplish. Who desires that? Remember in the beginning we said it's a matter of who are you going to present yourselves to? Are you going to present yourselves to the flesh? Are you going to present yourselves to the Spirit? In the morning, maybe that's what we should be doing. So then, after seeking spiritual things, seeking the will of God, then we are going to receive gifts. There are seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, these are the gifts. The fear of God to overcome sinfulness. That's a nice one. If you don't have the fear of God, why would you ever worry about sinning? So that's the beginning, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But then there's the spirit of strength to live by the virtues. Someone was asking me, hey Mark, do you have any talks on forgiveness? I realize this person is struggling with forgiving. Forgiving is a difficult thing. It's not something you can oftentimes do on your own, but if you are receiving the gift of the Spirit to do the virtue of forgiveness, so oftentimes we have to be asked or ask God to give us the ability to live by the virtue. Then giving us the skill, counsel, spirit of counsel. That's beautiful. Who does not need the skill of discernment? 
where to walk, what decisions to make. Am I in the will of God? The skill, spirit of understanding to realize the blessings that have been given to you. I don't think many of us have this. <laughs> we really do not comprehend how much we have until you've gone to a place where they have nothing, and yet they're still thankful. You're like, what? You've got nothing. <laughs> and they, you're like, they have the spirit of, of understanding. Spirit of knowledge to understand the Bible that's incredible. We oftentimes, you know, especially the youth, oh, why don't you read the Bible? I don't get it. Okay, I understand, but are you asking God to open your eyes? Yesterday, one of our sisters was uh, baptized and chrismated, and she was walking around the church. You guys all, or maybe were held, uh, some of you were able to walk, but you walk with a candle. Why do you walk with a candle? Because now you have the Holy Spirit, which brings light and illuminates your mind and your heart to discern the things that are spiritual. Um, and then spirit of wisdom, contemplation of truth. Okay, so then there are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then there are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Do you guys, where are the fruits of the Holy Spirit? In what book? Don't say Bible. Okay, Galatians, what chapter? Five, little hint. Five and verses? So, oh, look at this. Amazing. Galatians 5, 22. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So are these things that you work at? No, they're actually an outcome of the work of the Holy Spirit in you. You don't say, I'm going to work at love and I'm going to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. No, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is the, you know, like a tree where there's water and sunlight and all of a sudden fruit comes. The tree doesn't make fruit. I mean, it does, but like it's based on the work of the gardener that the fruit comes, right? So the Holy Spirit, why does it, allow that you know you can tell someone who's walking with the spirit because they have not love for like their their family okay they love their family that's not the fruit of the spirit when they love those who don't love them back when they love those who are strangers when they love those who, all of a sudden they have a sense of peace in the midst of trouble You're like i don't get where do you get that from it came from god also there's some people that they just don't worry about things because they have a sense of peace so you can't just work at peace i mean you can work at it but ultimately it comes to fruition when the Spirit of God is working in you and you are working with the Spirit of God. So one of the fathers says the goal of the spiritual life is to acquire the Holy Spirit. His name is Saint Seraphim of Sarov. He's a, a Russian saint who, I, I won't talk about him, he, he, it's a whole story, but he says the true goal of our Christian life consists in the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. And he says, what God requires is a true faith in himself and his only begotten son. In return, he generously bestows the grace of the Holy Spirit. The Lord seeks hearts filled with love for God and for one's neighbors. And so we acquire the Holy Spirit, he says, through faith. It is through faith. And in another part of the book, he says, through prayer. It's hard to think that you will receive the Spirit of God if you are never communicating, communicating to God in the Spirit which is through prayer. And so that is a critical thing that we must do. Now, I just want to say a few last things. Do you guys know what the epiclesis is in the liturgy? It's okay, I didn't know either. So when the priest asks for the Holy Spirit to come down, it's called the epiclesis. And so what someone was talking about like a lot of time in the icons or we pray like this, why? This opening of hands is receiving. And so he was saying that our lives should be an epiclesis. Our lives should be a receiving of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of your life. And so maybe that's something that we should be praying for more in our lives. We, play with op we pray with open hands, seeking God. Can you please bless this part of my life with your spirit? I need the gift of the spirit to understand. Give me the spirit of discernment in this situation. The more you are praying like this, the more you have a chance to be receiving the Holy Spirit grace-filled life. The other thing is this. Uh, when you are chrismated, you are sealed. This word sealed in Greek that they used to use in the early church, it stood for a few things. They used that word sealed for an animal that was going to be sacrificed or a soldier enlisted in an army or a slave. And the Bible says you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. You were stamped. 
You want to know what that stamp is? The fathers say that stamp is the imprint of Jesus Christ on you. So when your eyes and ears and mind were imprinted or sealed with the Holy Spirit, that means they are meant to be consecrated. They belong to Jesus Christ. And so remember I said the Spirit against the flesh and the flesh against the Spirit. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. You were imprinted with Jesus Christ on your eyes, your ears. So then I want you to now think about this. It's either flesh or spirit. Most of the sins of flesh happen through our senses, through what we see, what we say, what we hear, and what we do. And those were actually consecrated for God. You were sealed as a temple. You were stamped with Jesus Christ. So, I want you to start praying and working on this aspect. Dear God, you who stamped my eyes with your spirit, let my eyes have a vision of what you want for me. Let my eyes have a vision of where you want me to serve. Let my eyes have a vision of what you want for me. Let me be able to hear your calling. Let me be able to hear the voices of your people. Give me, uh, you know, the sense of smell. You're like, well, how is that a spiritual thing? Oftentimes... In the Bible, it says a sweet savor of incense rose to God like Jesus Christ was the sweet savor. We are the aroma of Christ to those, it says in 2 Corinthians. There is this work of God that oftentimes is perceived as a sweet-smelling incense. And sometimes when you're around very holy people, they have a special smell, a special scent. And you're like, oh. so the scent help me to sense your presence and your work. Dear God, you sanctified my heart. Give me a heart that has compassion for your people. Give me a heart that has love for you. So you stamped my life. Let me use these senses and consecrate them back to you. So again, it's either the flesh or the spirit. Or what are we using our senses for? So I realize most of us have phones. And most of us probably look at our phones quite often. When you are using your senses to look at your phone, is it for the flesh or for the spirit? Oftentimes it's for the flesh. Not, I'm not saying it's terrible to look at your phone, but is there a way to sanctify what you see? How many of you, like, okay, whether we're looking at Instagram or Facebook, what are we looking at? A lot of times we're looking at pictures or reading short, short quotes. How many of you have pictures of icons or saints that lift your mind towards God where you can just scroll and scroll if anyone wants them, I have a picture of like a thousand sayings of like saints or icons. They just blow my mind. Where if I can train myself, instead of just randomly scrolling at whatever pictures, I'm scrolling through the words of God, the saints, whatever, and all of a sudden my eyes are now being offered to God as opposed to just the flesh. You guys can hear so many nice things. Uh, SoundCloud, Audible, you have whole books. There. I mean, there's so much. You can fill your ears with so much. And then your lips... Be seasoned with salt. Let them be filled with grace. So th the first thing I said was, pray like this. Ask the Holy Spirit to be in every aspect of your life. The other thing is, your senses, which oftentimes are used for the flesh, let them be used for, for the Spirit. Um, that's basically all I want to say, is that I pray that the fast of the Holy Spirit, which we are in, Fast is controlling the flesh so that the Holy Spirit can work in you. The Holy Spirit is like one of my favorite topics because all things are possible to those in whom the Holy Spirit works. The shadow of Peter was healing the sick. The handkerchiefs of St. Paul was the handkerchiefs. What, was, what do you use handkerchiefs for? For disgusting stuff, right? They say it might have been the pus from a part of his body. He had an illness, whatever. And yet that was healing people? Yeah, it's the work of the Spirit in a person's life, it makes you little messiahs, or little anointed ones, little Christs. So this should be our main pursuit, that the Spirit of God would work in us, chisel, chisel all the flesh away so that we would become more spiritual. I'm gonna, we're going to stand and pray, but if you have your uh, Coptic reader, the absolution of the third hour is actually a beautiful one. And I want to read that one to you, or read it as our prayer together. I like, the, I love the third hour psalms and the third hour. Okay, don't listen to this part, but don't record. But sometimes, like the third hour, I used to pray it at night because I.
Spirit. And so if you want the Holy Spirit, pray the third hour. Let's stand up and pray together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, again, we're going to read the absolution and the conclusion. O God of all compassion and Lord of all comfort, who comforted us at all times with the comfort of your Holy Spirit, we thank you for you raised us for prayer in this holy hour, in which you abundantly poured the grace of your Holy Spirit upon your holy disciples, excuse me, and honorable and blessed apostles like tongues of fire. We ask and entreat you, O lover of mankind, accept our prayers, forgive our sins, and send forth upon us the grace of your Holy Spirit. Purify us from all defilement of body and spirit. Change us into a spiritual manner of life, that we may walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Make us worthy to serve you with purity and righteousness all the days of our life. For unto you is due glory, honor, dominion with your good Father and the Holy Spirit now and ever unto ages of all ages. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great mercy and your great kindness that you took vessels of clay and you made us temples of your Holy Spirit. We want to draw closer to Jesus Christ. We want to know him. We want to see him clearly. I pray, dear Lord, that you would allow us to submit to your spirit. I pray that your spirit would sometimes lead us forcefully. I know that oftentimes we resist. I pray for everyone that needs grace to overcome resisting the spirit. I pray that you supply that grace. I pray, dear Lord, for everyone that is grieving the Spirit, for everyone that is quenching the Spirit, I know at times my flesh is taking over, wanting me to not listen to you. I pray for your mercy, and I pray that you would give us the grace of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would give us purity, justice, authority, righteousness, discernment, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. I pray that your Spirit would transform each and every one of us, chisel away all the things that look evil, that look worldly, that look flesh. I pray, dear Lord, that everyone here would be made more and more by your spirit into your image we ask for the blessings of this holy fast in each and everyone's life be with those who have gone on a mission to share your word i pray that your spirit would work mighty things in them for them and through them in your precious name we pray the intercession of our beloved mother saint mary and all the saints who by your spirit pleased you from the beginning hear us and we your children cry unto you by your spirit saying with one voice our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one through christ jesus our lord for thine is the kingdom the power the glory forever and ever amen after hearing about the spirit and the flesh, we're inviting you to eat the tacos uh, downstairs. Uh, please enjoy. <laughs> God be with you.